All right, I think we're on. Good morning, everybody, and uh, good afternoon, depending on where you are. For the next hour or so, I'll be talking to Major General uh, Kevin Copsey, Deputy Commander of Operation Enhanced Resolve, uh, which is the U.S.-led campaign against ISIS uh, in Iraq and Syria. I'm Bilal Saab. I run the Defense and Security Program at the Middle East Institute, where I'm also a senior fellow, uh, and uh, I teach at Georgetown University's uh, School of Foreign Service. Uh, today's event is the ninth episode of uh, MEI's Defense Leadership Series. Uh, the series is a high-level um, platform we created back in uh, June uh, of this year. And uh, it's a platform where current uh, and former uh, military and defense leaders from both the United States and uh, the region are able to discuss some of the most important policy issues facing uh, the two sides. Uh, we were extremely fortunate to inaugurate the series uh, on June 10th with a conversation uh, with the commander of CENTCOM, uh, Frank McKinsey. Uh, since then, we've had the honor of uh, hosting uh, some of the country's brightest, most seasoned uh, leaders in the defense space, uh, including former USDP, uh, Michelle Flournoy, uh, the current DSA director, uh, Heidi Grant, uh, the current CENTCOM deputy commander, Jim Malloy, who uh, just recently transitioned uh, into that role, having served earlier as the uh, NAF SANT uh, commander. Uh, we also hosted USDP, former USDP Jim Miller, uh, former uh, SOCOM uh, commander uh, Mike Nagata, the current CENTCOM security cooperation chief uh, Duke Pirak, the former ASD for international security affairs uh, Derek Cholet, and of course uh, the former Lebanese armed forces uh, commander, uh, or I should say rear admiral, uh, Joseph Serkis. Let me take this opportunity to thank uh, CENTCOM and its leadership for their partnership with us at MEI. And we're especially honored uh, and proud of working with you. I do recognize we need to bring in more officials or officers from the region uh, on this show, but believe me, that is not for lack of trying. Uh, it's not an easy uh, uh, thing to do for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but that said, I am committed to this endeavor uh, and we'll keep trying. Uh, today, we have the privilege of having with us uh, Major General Kevin Copsey, who holds the position of Deputy Commander of Strategy for Combined uh, Joint Task Force for Operation Enhanced Resolve. And I'll be talking to him about the status of the anti-ISIS uh, campaign in Iraq and Syria and the future of that effort. I encourage you to check out our guest's bio on our website, but let me briefly introduce him. Uh, Major General Kevin Copsey, who's from the UK, was commissioned to the Royal Engineers in April 1990. He's had a long and distinguished career with postings around the world in Europe, but also in Afghanistan. He worked at the Ministry of Defense in London uh, and at NATO. Uh, and just two years ago, he became the British Army's head of future force development, responsible for delivering a new army operating concept, which is not an easy thing, easy thing to do. Uh, General, uh, welcome to uh, MEI's Defense, Defense Leadership Series. Uh, I, I recognize that we might be facing some technical issues today, but um, we'll, we'll be patient with that. And uh, uh, we uh, uh, recognize also that at some point you might have to uh, uh, remove the video so that we can probably get a little bit better quality uh, sound from you. Um, but let me just once again welcome you and thank you for agreeing to do this with us. Uh, it's an important conversation. Um, and uh, let, let, me, let me say that for those less familiar with OIR and CENTCOM, uh, uh, perhaps General, you could just tell us, uh, how does it work to have someone like you, a British national, uh, uh, serving in an American combatant command such as uh, CENTCOM? Uh, that's great. And um, Bihal and the rest of the team uh, in the Middle uh, Institute, it's been fantastic. Thank you very much for inviting me and giving the opportunity for us to, to talk about what has been a successful military campaign and, and, and how we actually made that journey to where we are now and the opportunities as we reflect uh, to what the future could look like here in Iraq and, and northeast Syria. And yes, it is unusual that we have a British deputy uh, based out here. I'm, I'm actually sat inside uh, OAR's headquarters in Baghdad. There was only a small group of us that here that touched the uh, Iraqi security forces as we continue the defeat of Daesh. But this headquarters, uh, which predominantly is based down in Camp Arafjan in Kuwait, is actually made up of 27 different nations that sit within a broader international coalition of 80. 
And so within the headquarters itself, uh, one has a, a US a Lieutenant General as the boss, then myself as the deputy, but, but then below is a whole mixture of uh, international officers from various different nations, each one bringing a unique optic that together blends uh, a wonderful uh, way in which we can approach the security challenges set by Daesh uh, and also the opportunity to work alongside the Iraqi security forces in them actually getting after that defeat. So it's a very humble position to be. It's, it's insightful and interesting and uncertain as well. Uh, and all that look blended together actually makes it to be a, a very challenging position as well. Got it. Uh, well, I heard you like mountaineering and alpine skiing. Where did that come from? So a lot of my earlier time in the army was spent in Germany and uh, the British military put a great premium on trying to to stretch you both physically and mentally, if not on the battlefield and operations, but high up in mountains, in altitude, in, in areas that you're uncomfortable with. So, so that was really how it started. And we pursue within the British military quite a semi-professional uh, approach to a lot of the sports and in particular alpine skiing. So I started to race for the army uh, for a number of seasons until just one gets a little bit too old in, in the twilight of your skiing career. Uh, and now I spend my time as the president of the winter sports, put in a little bit of, of what I know uh, and have been provided for by the British military back into the system so that soldiers within the British military can enjoy the snow that I enjoyed uh, and develop accordingly. So it's a really, really good opportunity. Okay, let's, uh, let's make a deal, uh, General, before we start this conversation. If you sense that I'm about to ask you any question that's actually policy based, just raise a red flag or throw at me a yellow card or something, because I understand that CENTCOM doesn't really do policy, it implements policy coming from civilian leadership in the Pentagon and the State Department, uh, but I just can't help myself. So if you do see that there's anything there that's really more of a policy oriented question, just tell me, I, there's no way I can answer that. Is that a deal? Absolutely fine, absolutely fine, right. thanks. Okie dokes, all right, so let me start with this um, broad question. Uh, six years ago, this organization ISIS uh, controlled a landmass roughly the size of Britain, right? Uh, subjugating the lives of eight to nine million people. Um, but today it's lost all that territory, or at least nearly all of it, uh, and a lot of its resources, uh, thanks to the uh, campaign that uh, you're helping lead uh, General, which is Operation Inherent Resolve. Um, and of course the work of a lot of the local and regional partners um, uh, that have been quite helpful. Uh, just. Let's start with this. Describe to us the, the main elements of the campaign uh, you've pursued all these years to achieve what you just described in the beginning, a uh, military success, right? Uh, and to significantly degrade the capabilities of this uh, organization. Yeah, thanks. So you know, we're in the twilight of what has been a successful military campaign. And you know, let's, let's reflect that when, when ISIS became a sub-state, governing almost 110,000 square kilometers is alongside the Iraqis, 79 other nations came together to form this coalition. It was you know, arguably the largest coalition that's come together since the Second World War, uh, all with a, a unity of approach to defeat uh, Daesh, um, not just in the Levant, but because of the threats that that had globally as well. And we can talk later on about how terrorism metacizes around the globe, irrespective of national borders. And, and the coming together of that uh, brought together about 27 nations with various types of military capability. But the key bit was, and still is, is to enable the Iraqi security apparatus, uh, be it the Peshmerga, the conventional forces down in the south, counter-terrorism service, or, or even the Syrian democratic forces over in the northwest. You know, over 120,000 have been trained over the four years. And it was that force, the partner forces, the ones that took the fight to Daesh, they're the ones that fought through the streets of Mosul. They're the ones that liberated and dismantled the caliphate. Uh, and then the coalition was there to provide that enabling support, you know, the artillery, the, the air power that was needed, the intelligence, the surveillance. Uh, and to a degree, some of that is, is provided now. So you know, we, we have actually gone past what has been the, the high intensity part of the conflict. 
and we've dismantled the physical part of Daesh. That, that's where we've defeated them, and that's objectively easy to measure. Where we've still got work to do is to undermine their finances and their and their narrative. And again, we can talk about that a little later on. But what what really changed was two things. One was the fall of Bagut last year, which see us go from high intensity into this final chapter of our military campaign. Uh, and bizarrely, COVID as well. The, the, the COVID pandemic, when it hit the Middle East, caused uh, a lot of nations, because we couldn't be that close to our Iraqi partners doing the training, to go back home to their host nations. And, and two things happened. Uh, the first of which was realizing that the Iraqis actually are good enough. They are strong, they are professional, they have the capability to get after the defeat of Daesh. Uh, and then it also allowed us to realize that we've entered a new part of the campaign from this high intensity into the, into the final chapter or phase four, as we would call it. And, and as we hollowed out our force, we started to recalibrate ourselves intellectually from doing the tactical level training for the security forces up into mentoring and advising at the higher operational level. So where I sit today in, in central Baghdad in the international zone is I'm in a, in a camp that is co-located with the Joint Operational Command Iraq. And that Joint Operational Command deploys and emphasizes against Daesh. Uh, and we sit back and we watch and we monitor and we help them in the planning tools needed for them to get after that, that final defeat piece. So without forces, where, where else does, does Operation Inherent Resolve focus? Well, we still divest equipment to make sure that the Iraqi security operations can go through a modernization program that allows them to overmatch Daesh to fund uh, particular streams of salaries to make sure that those soldiers, as they're going out and risking their lives, are actually appropriately paid. So, and, and that's been about 5 billion over the course of the campaign that's been given in divestments uh, or stipends as, as we would call it. We've also had to rebalance our force. As COVID hit, we realized that we're in too many bases that were not needed anymore. So we transitioned many of those across to the Iraqi security forces. The last one that we did was Camp Taji, uh, which was in early September this year. Uh, and in doing so, you've now got the Iraqi security forces that have the footprint that allows them to be balanced across the country to get after the defeat of Daesh. So, so upon reflection, we've done high intensity. We've recalibrated intellectually into the operational level for the support that they need. And we've rebalanced our force to actually support the Iraqis in what they need, uh, rather than the, the wants and desires that were needed during, during the phase three. Copy. Uh, General, I don't know if um, you're able to hear me just fine, but uh, I think the sound was fine um, on your end, but maybe the video is a little bit um, freezing. So um, maybe for the next few minutes, we'll, uh, we'll turn out the video on your end and uh, we'll see if that gets any better. Is that okay? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. All right. Um, so I think you said it yourself, and this is um, really no secret. Uh, the organization is not defeated. It is really on the ropes, uh, I hope at least, uh, militarily speaking, uh, its capabilities severely degraded, but it is not defeated. And of course, that requires, yes, I'm going to use those words like a whole government approach, right? Uh, and that requires you know, the involvement of much more than CENTCOM, uh, but many other elements of national power. But, uh, but just tell us, uh, what kind of threat does this organization still pose uh, to today? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so what I would say is that I, Daesh is, is definitely down, but not out. Uh, we've dismantled the physical caliphate, but there are areas, there are seams geographically and conceptually where uh, they can still operate, but they do not operate operate in a joined up, well-led fashion at all. They, they have resorted to life uh, as a criminal, that they're in survival mode, that it's all about uh, theft, extortion and kidnapping. They are operating in rural areas where, uh, which are easy enough to be, um, to be targeted by, by the Iraqi security forces. And, and there's probably four areas that we have of concern. Uh, one is Euphrates River Valley, 
right. with uh, the the Daesh uh, operating there and obviously trying to exploit the inter-tribal dynamics and the geography of that area. There is also the um, the disputed territories between the influence of Baghdad and Erbil and that gap that changes distance uh, right the way along what is known as the Kurdish coordination line. Uh, and then also that porous border between uh, Iraq and into Syria. Now, certainly the latter two, we work alongside Syrian democratic forces uh, and the Iraqi security forces at their leadership level to try and tie up operations that are mutually supporting each other to try and tie down uh, any way in which Daesh could exploit the border. And similarly, with the Kurdish coordination line is to keep on encouraging uh, both the Pashmurga in the north uh, and the Iraqi security force in the south to have joint coordination and joint operations. And, and to be fair, both parties have actually made huge inroads in starting to get after that. And, and only together, collectively, can they continue that squeeze on Daesh, particularly in the Makmo Mountains. But it's, it's the fourth area that's probably the biggest concern, and that is the IDB camps and detainee camps, particularly those in northeast Syria. The Syrian Defence Force have done a fantastic job of administering and containing and running those particular institutions. Uh, but it's what's happening inside them that OAR has no mandate for uh, and no involvement in. But we do both encourage, train and provide equipment for the SCF for them to do their job in looking after them. But what I do fear is uh, without there being a, an international political microscope placed on these locations that the uh, that the threat of uh, a Daesh 2.0 could be realized because within that you've got command and control and you've also got their ability to permeate their murderous narrative and we, and as well as also finance and finance networks and there are other organizations that are involved in dismantling those parts right. but but that's the one bit that would be my worry bead is is those those particular institutions over perfect segue uh, general but why don't we try to have you back on in video see if that works a little bit okay so perfect segue because uh, i think this merits a sort of a an in-depth conversation about this whole issue of resurgence, because there's been um, a good bit of analysis coming out of Washington uh, by reasonable and uh, seasoned analysts um, regarding this issue of resurgence. So how, tell us how does CENTCOM view the issue of resurgence? How do you understand it? Uh, do you buy the fact that it actually really is, you know, uh, returning to what it was before? Uh, how are you addressing How are you addressing this and how, you, how concerned are you about it? I mean, I think you already started you know, talking about it, but tell, tell me a little bit more about this uh, issue. So the, the, the issue is a lot of observers would say, well, there has been a, a slight increase in Daesh activity and therefore it, it is resurging. Right. Um, is it resurging in a cohesive group that is able to seize territory to try and regain what it believes is a caliphate? No, it is not. Uh, what it is doing, of course, is is having an allergic reaction to the amount of pressure that has been put on them on a daily basis in every domain, land, yeah. air, and, and in the narrative by the Iraqi security forces, by the Peshi in the North and the SDF. And, and that's bound to create a reaction when you push a tiger into a corner. And of course, as, as Daesh yeah. do get more active at the, at the local level, it illuminates more networks and intelligence for the Iraqis and our other partners to exploit and work upon. So there is that cause and effect on one hand where you have this proactive forward leaning security apparatus uh, and then it then pushes Daesh into doing a counteraction. But that counteraction will have diminishing returns over a period of time because they become easier and easier to target. They become more and more geographically fragmented uh, and then able to deal with. And then there's other parts of the coalition that would also assist the Iraqis in, in ensuring that we can actually help undermine the narrative in the information environment as well, which is, is arguably just as important, if not more important than the, than the physical domain. You talk about the detainees, uh, General. Um, it's a big issue um, that could probably be described as a ticking time bomb. Uh, the United States government believes that uh, there's a high impact risk of, I mean, at least that was back in May. I don't know if it's still the uh, issue today, but there's 
high risk of a mass breakout of ISIS prisoners uh, from those detention camps uh, run by the SDF. Um, there are about like 20 of them, I guess, in Northeast uh, Syria. They got 2,000 foreign fighters and roughly, I don't know, 8,000 Iraqi Syrian fighters. Uh, I mean, how concerned are you about that? I think you already started addressing it. Uh, this could perhaps aid any resurgence that might happen for ISIS if there is a mass uh, breakout. What is the capacity of the SDF to really sustain this? Um, over to you. Yeah, that's a fair question. So I can't answer for, for some of those institutions that are outside of the area that we operate in, but certainly within what we call the Eastern Syria security area, uh, the ESSA, uh, those detainee camps that are administered and run so well by the Syrian Democratic Forces is we're very alive to any potential for a breakout. And, and there's been numerous attempts that have happened you know, in previous months. But conversely, we've now been able to, using the divestment of equipment that I described earlier on as, as part of our phase four bit of the campaign, is to provide you know, non-lethal apparatus to allow them to govern the prisons properly, the, the detention center, sorry, uh, as well as also CCTV cameras and to upgrade not just the sanitation, the food delivery, but also the security within it as well, to make sure that the SDF then feel more confident and comfortable in being able to deliver it. And, and there's numerous other uh, areas where the coalition has created infrastructure projects to also aid that. So for example, the Hasaka prison, Princip Hasaka prison is, is having an extension that's been funded by the coalition that will allow the, uh, the detainees to be decanted into uh, areas that are um, th that would allow them to sort of spread out and allows easier control by SDF. We've enhanced the women's prison also in Hasaka with areas where they can also have their, their extended families with them and, and also funded a youth rehabilitation center as well. Because noting that Daesh 2.0 is also gonna be focused on, on the children, the, the cubs of the caliphate as they were once known as in some of the IDP camps and elsewhere. And, uh, and by actually taking them into these rehabilitation camps and um, facilities has been able to actually expose them to an alternative to the narrative. And that has been a, a wonderful initiative that's happened and we're looking to try and expand that with the SEF in, in due course. So am I concerned about mass breaks out? It, it is always a worry. Are we doing our best to mitigate it? Yes, through the training and divestments to the Syrian Democratic Forces. Do they feel comfortable and confident in delivering the security that's required? Absolutely. So I, I think we're in a, in a really good place at the moment for those areas that we uh, are deployed in within the ESSA. Copy. Um, I really feel bad that we can't have your video on all the time, uh, but you know, let's just keep alternating every now and then, I guess. Uh, I'll leave it up to you, General. I don't want to be too, uh, bother too much bother bothering you. So let me ask you two more questions about the, the operation itself. I then try to reflect uh, a little bit more broadly about the campaign. Um, and I might be borderline violating the agreement that I have with you as far as policy, but this is not really directly a policy question. It's more about the consequences of policy. So as you very well know, we've, we've, <clears throat> we've done a lot to uh, enhance the capabilities of our Iraqi partners, uh, the counterterrorism capabilities, and we've supported the SDF militarily. Uh, what will happen to those efforts if we do leave or significantly reduce our military footprint in uh, Iraq? And try to tie it back to everything you've said before as far as resurgence, as far as our effort to uh, 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 defeat uh, the organization. Uh, what would happen if we leave to those efforts at least? Okay, I'll, I'll try the video and, and we'll see how we get it on. So that's a, a fair a fair comment, if, if only because one is always fearful of a dependency culture of right. what inherent resolve brings to our partners. Um, but what I think we need to be very mindful of is exactly how good those partners are and how little we actually do now is inherent resolve. Yep. The day-to-day -day operations are done by Iraqis or SDF. Uh, we, we have hollowed out, you'll have seen the recent announcements of ever decreasing US in particular troops going down and down, uh, caused by COVID, caused by the recalibration into this operational level of advising that I spoke about earlier. 
and and we sit alongside them in the jock and up in herbal as well and within uh, uh, command nodes within the ESSA and and that is it and they right. plan they, they take their own intelligence they plan on it they exploit any operation into the right evidence required to feed a judicial process so that momentum is there now the still probably work to do that there is still need but the day-to-day -day operations has such a strong momentum behind it that as we see the twilight of our mission out here i have no doubt that they have the abilities to keep on going now that said when oir finally diminishes it will be replaced by different apparatus of security sector reform so within the the camp i'm in here in baghdad You've got the NATO mission in Iraq, and that's looking at institutional. I lost you there, General. They'll also be offering their own key skills into the Iraqi security apparatus to fill whatever capability gaps they need. So as, as one leaves, it will be gently replaced in other areas. Sorry, General. Probably best to uh, yep. uh, discontinue the video. Did you miss some of that? Just, just a little bit, yeah. 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 Okay. How much of that did you get? No, a good bit, but just, just the very last uh, bit of it. Okay. Sorry. So, so That's yeah. Fine. So, um, inherent resolve. You know, we we have a complementary mission with NATO mission Iraq. There's a just set up here, uh, and that will be focused at the institutional level. So, so when observers believe that uh, things will go south with the demise of OIR, actually the support that Iraqis and the partners will receive, it just it just changes form into a different style of delivery by a different organization. Right, copy, okay. Um, let me ask you a tactical sort of slash operational question and then uh, well, we'll talk about it, the other significant challenge that you guys have to face, uh, which is the uh, Shiite militias uh, in Baghdad. Um, has the September deployment of Bradley's um, the armored vehicles uh, and other equipment into northeast Syria had any effect on Russia's uh, brinkmanship and harassing of your patrols? Okay, so the, the deployment of the Bradleys is an interesting uh, inflection point for the operation. So we finished the high intensity, we're into phase four, we had reduced uh, troop numbers because of COVID, we'd recalibrated into the operational space. Right. What we needed to do was to send a very clear message to, to Daesh was that we still have the ability to demonstrate our capability and our capacity to move around both Iraq and Northeast Syria at a time and place of our choosing to reinforce our partners. So deploying the Bradleys to help reinforce the SDF was a demonstration of that, to show that unannounced we can flex our capability around uh, to just reinforce the point that you know e even though we may lack numbers we still have the ability and the commitment uh, to get after that that defeat Daesh piece but the you know as far as the, the, the Russians are concerned out here you know we don't coordinate with them we do deconflict our activities in both time and space uh, and I think it's reflective of of the wider um, number of nation states that are involved out here. Each of those would seem to be in competition for influence. But from our perspective, uh, particularly in Northeast Syria, the focus is alongside the SDF and focus very much on that Daesh to make sure that they don't research, particularly in areas like the Euphrates River Valley. Yeah. Um, at the risk of getting you in trouble, uh, General. So let me let me take you to Utopia, and then just you can have your you know Christmas list of things that you want. Um, what other capabilities would you love to have that could really aid your mission? Uh, recognizing that size is not what's most important, right at this point, um, especially if the numbers keep uh, dwindling. But what other capabilities do you boy would you really like have to have uh, to support your mission? It's, it's going to have to be the Iraqi government being able to manage and take the baton of success from the mission to its rightful conclusion. That's, that's what we need. Do we need military capabilities out here? 
absolute not at all. Uh, okay. Do we need NATO mission Iraq out here to do institutional reform? Absolutely, yes. But as, as this campaign winds down, what you need is is the right ability for the security apparatus to hand over to the judicial apparatus. And, and that needs to go hand in hand with trying to resolve all the other security challenges that the government faces. The sources of instability of which all the OIR has done is deal with the symptoms. And that's the key thing that we need to get after, not, not the military anymore. Copy, okay. Um... What's your confidence level, one to 10, 10 being highest, of uh, the ability of the uh, Iraqi partners to sustain some of the uh, equipment and the advice that we give them, should we continue to draw down? I, I think it's, I've, I've got to be the optimist, actually. I think it's between seven and eight. And the Not reason bad. why I say that, and what would get them higher, yeah, but what, what would get them higher? Is, is that institutional reform that NATO will offer. So the ability, if there was, the, you know, if the economy could be, could be more robust than it is now, the ability to do fiscal planning, to do career planning for its uh, soldiers across the board, the ability to properly man and train and do capability uh, development of their armed forces, effectively to run a peacetime army, to manage readiness, and have a readiness cycle. That's that's what the Iraqis need. That's that's the thing that will help self-sustain it against any threat to its national security. And and unfortunately, OAR won't be there to deliver it. But there are organ other organisations, and and NATO will be the start of that journey. And that uh, introducing policies, introducing the ability to sustain and maintain the plethora of vehicles and platforms that they have. If it starts at the very top and percolates down. Then, then we will be able to actually have that um, self-sustaining force that I just described. I don't have a problem with NATO uh, delivering those services, but isn't the United States government also helping out on the institutional front? Yeah, as are many other nations as well. You will have seen, uh, you know, for example, you've got the uh, economic contact group that was set up. There have been uh, some of the Scandinavian nations that have got involved in the judicial process to help reinforce that. You've got other European nations that have signed up to support the UN um, request for electoral support as well for next year. So everybody you know, who form part of this global coalition are still showing that commitment in institutional reform or in other niche areas that the Iraqi government needs to help. And, and clearly the US is playing a big part in that, um, but, it, but it is also been equally matched by other nations as well. How long do you think we're keeping uh, CETA, the authority uh, to combat uh, ISIS? Because here's the thing, this is why I'm asking you, General, because the moment we transition out of that and sort of start developing more normal, quote unquote, relations with the Iraqis is probably when we're gonna be best able to use other funds to engage in institutional capacity building. So as long as there's CTEF, I don't think really when in a very strong position, at least vis-a-vis -vis Congress, to request other funds to do the institutional capacity building. So how long are we keeping CTEF? So CTEF has been passed by Congress, certainly for the immediate future, albeit a slightly less rate. But that said, it is, it is the one fund that uh, gives us our freedom of action and helps change behaviors as well in the way it is administered. So it is a really important um, lever that we have with the Iraqis as well. And it's one that is managed quite judiciously by us in, in how it's actually implemented. So you know, of everything that we do, this operational uh, advising mission at the moment is CTEF ultimately helps enable that and, and needs to stay around, certainly in the immediate term, uh, for some time to come. Robbie, let's talk about the other challenge that you're facing. And you probably agree with me that you are more worried about it than ISIS, at least at this stage, which is the Shiite militias in Baghdad. Um, I mean, I don't see ISIS trying to institutionalize its influence, uh, at least again in the Iraqi government, but those militias that are loyal to Iran are and you know how Iran, Iran is really good at that, whether it's in Lebanon and to some extent, Yemen, I guess. Um, so lack of a better word, what is the strategy for that other kettle of fish? 
So, yeah, I mean, it's, I find it a real shame that the Iraqis have gone through so much in the last six years and have shown extraordinary commitment and capacity in defeating Daesh. And yet we are now faced with a threat that also could, could rip the country apart. And yeah, the, these militia groups, uh, they say that they target the coalition and that they target our logistic convoys. Well, since November last year, they, they have only targeted 1.6% of our right. convoys. And even that has not hurt how we've rebalanced the force. They fire rockets in Union 3, that the, the base that, uh, that is the center for OIR, and yet we are nothing more than a tenant here. It's actually an Iraqi security forces base. We are in the minority here, uh -huh. surrounded by blocks of flats, by marketplaces, and, and they're, the, they're the impact sites for these missiles. And as you've seen recently, everything that the militia groups do, it's the Iraqi civilians that become the victims. In the, the death, in losing their work because they've targeted haulage vehicle companies, or in destroying the, the, the homes and the infrastructure and their vehicles that they rely on for their businesses. So it's almost heartbreaking to see these self-interested, these groups operating in self-interest, saying that it's for the Iraqi people, when actually what it's doing is it's targeting them. <coughs> Excuse me. Are you finished with the intervention, General? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. It's, um, and and uh, what I hope is that over time, there will be uh, more and more of a impetus by the Iraqi government, and they're very cognizant of it to address the militia groups. It's not within our mandate, within inherent resolve. Um, but what we are starting to see is some of these militia groups fracture even more and more because of their self-interest. And as they fracture, they become vulnerable. They get their narrative undermined. And, and as we'll see you know, recently was uh, the last missile attacks that we endured only a few weeks ago here is yeah. that in, in the media, it was on about them targeting the international zone. It wasn't the embassy, it wasn't coalition forces. And it's because they try to undermine the government, the very thing that's actually trying to give stability to the population. Yeah, Over. copy, copy. Uh, let me ask you a broader question. Uh, um, as I mentioned to you before, uh, General, you've been in this role now for some time, right? You've had a front row seat to OIR and um, you've been able to observe a lot of, you know, the, the, the evolution of the campaign, right? Um, how are you, I guess I'll ask you as a scholar, uh, um, as a practitioner as well, how are you looking at the next wave of international terrorism or how's the United, how does the United Kingdom Right. Uh, uh, perhaps it might have a different view than the United States government. How are you looking at the next wave of international terrorism? Uh, what is the next ISIS going to be like? Um, have you observed anything in OIR that gives you concern about future efforts to uh, groups like uh, ISIS? I'll be very interested in your view. So I think that like all terrorist groups, they continue to metasize into something new and unique their ability to exploit novel methods to get after funding, you know, Bitcoin, other similar sort of apparatus to, to work their business, their yep. ability to transcend time zones and international borders will become more commonplace. So no longer will terrorism, in my view, be constrained to one particular area. It will percolate very quickly uh, and transmit as well through a narrative back into any of the nations that we have in within the coalition. Uh, and that happens over time. And so we need to be really cognizant of when terrorism is being bred, or at least the sources of instability that could breed that terrorism, is that we do all we can with our engagement abroad to make sure that those countries that are struggling, that if left unchecked, that they would uh, end up perhaps accidentally breeding that terrorism is, uh, is that we can then deal with a source of instability together. And, and in only doing so, you then stop the, the symptoms from being created. And, and then that's where the military come in. As far as the military goes in how we deal with terrorists now, I'm seeing a far more different approach to how the uh, military lever of national power is, is used. 
yeah. it's used not just in the land but in the uh, in the narrative in the information space it's uh, it's used in the finance it's used far more discreetly rather than um, rather than mass far more dispersed uh, and so i think uh, what i would say is that isis i think a lot of people have learned a lot from that and and therefore it's not unsurprising that the global coalition remains committed and it isn't just in iraq it's also the instability that's breeding across the sahel and how that it, uh, it could be addressed uh, across there as well because as i say it does permeate time zones and continents quite readily uh, and also a better way in which we gain access to control funding routes to control kidnapping networks and kidnapping routes to work out particularly in Iraq at the moment, where a, strong, a stronger economy would also breed security, how to give or encourage the youth that they do have a future, that the public sector does not become too overinflated, that they have an opportunity for education and a job at the end of it. And, and more importantly, to have more compromise uh, between the religious tensions that often play out from which the seams of terrorism can exploit. So, so there's there's a lot to try and digest there, and and I think that the the coali the international coalition, I think academics, and I think militaries are are looking at at exactly how you would contribute towards the sources of instability, rather than leaving it too late and having to deal with the symptoms, which takes time, it takes money, and ultimately loses lives as well. Over. The next thing to worry about in terms of capabilities, uh, kinetic wise. So for a while we've struggled massively with the IEDs, right? Uh, that was our biggest uh, challenge. And now it seems to be unmanned systems. Uh, is that the next uh, threat to worry about as far as terrorist organizations having uh, access to unmanned systems? Absolutely. It's, you know, they are cheap. You can buy them from a shop. Uh, you could argue that they're relatively easy to arm and then deliver onto, you know, onto any particular target, not just a military target, but but anything, uh, as well as also you know, putting cameras on there for surveillance. So, so yes, on, on one hand, you have the, the extremists that could develop those sorts of capabilities it's relatively easy. But of course, to counter that is that you know, we, the military, have, have the capabilities to overmatch those, to deny them the very advantage that they're seeking. So I feel fairly confident uh, as we go forward. And, and that just isn't the military. This is you know, key civilian national infrastructure as well will face challenges like this as well. So I know that security apparatus for many different countries are wrestling with how to actually deal with uh, unmanned aerial systems in whatever shape or form they may be from a domestic um, policy level as well as, as the legalities as well. It's, it's gonna be common and, and prevalent in the future. Absolutely, over. What, what are some of the countermeasures that we're developing? I mean, so obviously ideally you wanna deny them access, right? So that's the I guess the best way to deal with that. But if you can't, uh, and it's obviously extremely difficult to do so given that you know it's a very globalized uh, market and uh, some of that stuff is just very easily can be picked up off the shelves, right? But what are some of the countermeasures that we're developing? Are we talking about, I don't know, short range uh, missile defenses or what? No, it's, it's probably more novel than that. A lot of companies now, certainly in my previous job when I was head future force development for the British Army, was that we were looking at, you know, defending civilian airfields or other bits of national infrastructure. And, and the first thing is to actually have, an, have the right equipment that can detect UAS. Right. They're very small, they're very agile. Yeah. Um, and how they're being controlled by the nature of a ground station or have they had routes uh, pre-planned within it so it can be set off and, and there isn't a ground station, you know, someone with a, uh, a, a sort of transmitting device in which they're controlling it like you would do a remote control car. Yeah. Clearly, if it's the latter, then, then they're often within sight of, of the unmanned system anyway. And then once you have decided whether or not it is friend or foe is then to decide if it's going to be what would be known as a, as a hard or soft kill. You could, you could almost take over the radio frequencies and take control of it yourself and land it safely. Or in extremists, you could reprogram it so it goes back to where it was sent from. Or a hard kill, which uh, the, there are numerous different technologies that have all been explored from lasers to radio frequencies where you would almost scrabble 
the uh, the actual electronics that, that cause the propellers to fail and just falls out of the sky. And and I think many companies are all equal in developing their own various systems for that, for both law enforcement and also the military as well. Yeah. I mean, as you as you describe these things, I can't help but think about the latest incident where the Iranian nuclear scientist was assassinated. It seems like there's a lot of automated systems that were used. I'm not saying non-state actors are going to have access to the same stuff, uh, but I mean, who knows? Down the road, uh, uh, those things might be more uh, available. Let's talk about the diplomatic element, General, because uh, obviously it's a key component of uh, success of OIR. And now moving forward, uh, Ambassador Jim Jeffrey uh, has, as you know, left the uh, State Department. Uh, describe to us the level of coordination that's been going on uh, between you guys and uh, Foggy Bottom, and tell us now what is the future of that effort uh, with the ambassador having left? Sure. So that's, I mean, that's very much US centric. So I'll have to turn it slightly on his head from, from my own experience. Um, yeah. the, the real challenge is that once you've done high intensity conflict and in which you have gained real unique success that what that we have over the last six years is how you then pass that baton onto the other levers of national power, in particular the diplomatic and the economic. And we've, we've kind of already done that with the government of Iraq, but within the 80 nation coalition is each of those nations, either as part of informal alliances like the EU, for example, or NATO, or as bilateral or informal groups, such as the, uh, the European Economic Contact Group that was formed up recently when um, Prime Minister Karimi visited London, through two single states also providing uh, diplomatic support, such as the US, is firstly to make sure that there is a unity of effort between them. Uh, and then secondly, is to ensure that all those operational games that, that have been fought so hard to realize uh, are handed over extremely well and and this is part of a campaign that that I would say to many people it's not taught in our war colleges how to end a campaign you only get, a, get taught how to start or how to manage them so intellectually we are in a in a different space at the moment which goes back to that recalibration point within our own headquarters we do have policy advisors uh, both from US uh, and from UK and also other countries as well that just help us navigate where the civil mill need to have that unity and to make sure that the ascendancy and primacy of the civil actors actually stays in the right place and that we just stay in that supporting lever continuing until no longer we're needed uh, or indeed invited by the government of Iraq. Um, now let's take it even further uh, more broadly uh, uh, talk about this uh, campaign and uh, look at it from a geopolitical uh, point of view um, and get to the core priority of the NDS, I guess, which is the great power competition. Um, so obviously we know that China is not involved militarily in Iraq, uh, nor in Syria, but Russia is um, in Syria. Um, how, how would you assess the role and influence of Russia today? And how is OIR leadership looking at also another actor or Turkish policy uh, moving forward. Is that gonna complicate matters or do you have more confidence that it could be managed? So I think irrespective of Turkey or Russia and their interests in the region, it is a hugely complex area that we operate within. And it isn't just that, that political military balancing act uh, that I was talking about to make sure it's done in, in the right, uh, in the right um, pro rata. But it's, it's also how you manage other nations as well. And, and what I would say is we, let's go back to my earlier point there, that we, we don't collaborate or coordinate with uh, the Russians or indeed even uh, the Turks in, in what they're doing. But we do deconflict, particularly with the Russians all the time, to make sure that there is not miscalculation at that lowest tactical level when we have troops that are operating you know, in, in quite close proximity to each other, just to make sure that, uh, that no one sort of has a misstep. What we do try to do, is is acknowledged that there are other nations that have other interests as well but to our partners the Iraqis the SDF and the Peshmerga is, is they look upwards at all these different nations is that they still look favorably at the coalition and indeed from your perspective the US as well as being the partner of choice because we're the ones that have actually shared that pain over the last six-year journey 
we're the ones that were alongside them, we're the ones that have sacrificed our own lives of coalition members to make sure that we can have conversations today talking about the successes of the Iraqis. And, and they, it is not lost on them, that commitment that previous commitment. And therefore we do, do see ourselves as being their, their partner of choice and, and that they wouldn't have a need to look uh, elsewhere for support that they're so ably getting from ourselves. Over. Copy that. Um, I, I, think, I think I should have asked you that right from the start, but how has COVID uh, dramatically affected your uh, operation? I mean, I know that Train and Equip has struggled because of that, because you can't see people as frequently um, uh, and engage uh, with the leadership, but, but just briefly uh, tell us how has COVID affected your, oper your operation? So surprisingly, it, the Iraqis have not missed a beat with COVID. I mean, it's yeah. been absolutely humbling. I go to their updates every night and I see them doing their operational planning as they're looking forward to a sustained tempo to get after what uh, whatever deployment that they're, they're going to go on. And... Uh, and it's totally COVID agnostic. And yet they still, they still adhere to the right protocols with COVID and all the rest of it. But I suppose when they then get onto the ground, it's all about administering security uh, and making sure that that's implemented in a, in a appropriate way that's sustainable. But um, as far as OIR goes, yes, we've, you know, we, we do more VTCs sadly now amongst each other. Um, yeah. That said, we do. We still do the physical contact, as in go and physically see the Iraqi government representatives, yep. and also the representatives of the Pashmurgo. I spend a lot of time travelling, just to give the uh, the commitment, the assurance. But also, when you're having these sorts of conversations, the, the human contact is paramount, and it's the body language, and you need to be able to have that mutual trust and a and a relationship to build upon. Uh, albeit it's done from the other side of a ballroom at times, but at least we, we go some way to try and do it as, as best we can. So it's not slowed down. It did provide the opportunities that I mentioned to force us to recalibrate. And uh, and ultimately the operational tempo of the Iraqis just haven't, hasn't missed a beat. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad you're saying that <clears throat> they have adhered to uh, all the necessary safety uh protocols uh but haven't missed a beat um I, let me just apologize one more time to the audience and to you general that, that we just don't have we don't seem to have as good quality uh, of the video but you're you're perfectly fine as far as sound and uh, i'm just sorry to ask you to keep uh turning off your video but may, maybe for the past uh, for the next i guess three or four minutes uh, as we're wrapping up here i'll ask you to turn it on and then just uh, uh have the final question for you uh which is in the next few weeks, right? They're going to be quite critical. And um, as we have a major transition here of leadership in Washington, uh, what are you guys tracking the most? What are you most worried about? Uh, I don't expect you to share with me any different contingency planning that you guys are doing, but you, you definitely will be uh, on a higher alert, uh, I guess, uh, in terms of uh, kinetic activities that might be coming from whether it's ISIS or the Shiite militias, but, but just how how are you tracking this transition? What are you most worried about? Thanks. Uh, I think there's going to be a number of themes that we're going to be focusing on over the next four or five weeks. Yep. I think is, the, uh, is that we are in a period of, of potential miscalculation, and it goes back to my earlier comments on the militia groups. Uh, as they, in my view, continue to fracture, some elements becoming more and more self-interested, uh, is that they could incite a violent act which would force a retaliation from the coalition or elsewhere. And, and also, I think a period of reflection as well is we have a lot of soldiers that are going to be here over the festive period away from their families for another year. And I think uh, so over our shoulder, we'll be looking back at that and realizing that we're going to be separated from our families again. But we honestly believe that what we're doing here is a righteous mission. And you know, earlier on, I mentioned how humbled I am to see the proficiency and the commitment of the Iraqi security forces. And, and if you were around the international zone, you would see many different flavors of that security apparatus. And they are here because they have a commitment for our security, for, for inherent resolve security. 
so that we can give them the brand and the enabling support they need to provide the very security to the Iraqi civilians to value in the conduct of their operations. So, so if you were to take the militia groups out of that equation, then, then I think we would be there to a, a really promising and, and stable Iraq at the moment. But the big boilers and big boats, and that's our focus of concern at the moment. Over. Happy. Uh, I want to give you the final uh, opportunity, General, to share with us any thoughts uh, before we uh, close. Uh, this has been extremely rich, insightful. We're so deeply really appreciative for your time, uh, certainly for your service as well. I threw at you all sorts of difficult questions, but you handled every single one effectively. Uh, but let me give you the opportunity to say any final words and maybe some advice for us researchers here, uh, whether it's an MEI or our peers, what are some of the things that you think we should be more focused on uh, writing about, researching on that could be of help to you guys? That's, that's really kind. Uh, well, first I would say with researchers, uh, one of the, the things that I was really keen to do General Lewis, uh, to allow us, the military to actually engage organizations like for, for what's actually taking place on the ground the dynamics. There you go. All right, we can hear I'll you. go back to pitch, is that okay? So, yeah, yeah. Sorry, so I'd further say, yeah. We keep dancing around the video. Thank I'm very you. sorry about that. Go ahead. That's okay. So from the from an academic perspective, I think it isn't so much what we want from you, it's you actually getting more from us. Uh, I think it's utterly fascinating to actually engage with ac academic institutions, uh, you know, both for two reasons. One is Operation Inherent Resolve, the success of military campaign. But secondly, from an academic perspective, is, is how we're now starting to see the change in nature of how military is deployed and employed in a period of constant competition and the way in which you calibrate the use of military below the below armed conflict. So I think that that's a, a really useful thing to, uh, to discuss and explore in the future. I think as you look out here in Iraq as academics is to try and explore the, uh, the ap appetite and the ambitions to get after the sources of instability. So we don't see ourselves back here in years to come and how they're being addressed and where possible that the reports that academic institutions write for our decision makers are focused on how we can best help and focus those efforts in sewing up and addressing some of those uh, sources of instability. By also being able to have a, a robust view on what the Iraqis want versus what they need. And sometimes there can be a difference between the two. And, uh, and, and I'll leave it up to the uh, academic world and the policymakers to understand what that difference is. And then really just as a sort of final summing up for me, you, know, you mentioned you know, the, the climbing, the skiing, and, and the, the sort of career that we all go through in the military. And it sort of prepares you throughout your time, throughout your jobs, to be right here, right at this moment, and bringing all that experience together and, and hopefully wisdom that can help try and impart on that alongside our partners with the support and the commitment that you get from above to make sure that we all have this unity of purpose in that final defeat of Daesh that I described, but knowing full well that we also have to have a weary eye on how that could metasize, if not Daesh, then indeed globally, how terrorism could also morph and threaten our, our freedoms wherever they may be. So I find myself extremely privileged to be part of this coalition. And, uh, and it is a righteous mission that is filled by many, many nations. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. We appreciate you, General. Thank you for your service uh, and for everything you've done. Uh, I know that you miss your kids, you miss your wife. Uh, hopefully you get to see them very soon. Uh, stay safe. Uh, we'll be in touch with you uh, and good luck with everything you're doing over there.